Welcome to this special edition of TFR Let's Talk for SLO Conf. I'm your host, Swapnil Bhatia. My next guest is Ian Bartholomew, Lead Site Reliability Engineer at Noble9. And today we are going to talk about open SLO. Ian, first of all, it's great to have you on the show. Great to be here. Thank you. What role is open playing there? Whether it could be open source from the perspective of code, it could be about a specification, it could be about you know a lot of other things that comes with the term open there. Yeah. So uh, maybe to answer that, I'll explain like kind of what the uh, and like what the initiative was or like what the inspiration for it. Uh, where it, it, we had a lot of different people in the industry trying to solve the same problem. Uh, we were kind of coming at it from different angles with different problem sets. Um, and a lot of us were, you know, reinventing the wheel in a certain, uh, to a certain extent. And so the idea came about to let's standardize this. Let's come about this with common terminology, common understanding. Um, and then by taking all of the different problem sets and requirements that everybody else has and putting this together in a common specification, the idea is that when people come into wanting to adopt SLOs, problems that they might have will all have already been solved and we can kind of talk about it and explain the, or, and, and work at it from a common specification. Um, you know, there was somebody that was talking uh, earlier today um, that they had tried to adopt SLOs in their organization earlier and uh, they were they had, had to come up with their own terminology, they had to come up with their own ideas and uh, by uh, adopting open SLO, they're hoping to you know be on the same playing field as everybody else. Um, they're wanting to uh, be able to again problem solve the same way or this, uh, work on said that wrong, but the uh, being able to uh, uh, gain the learning of everybody else. Um, the other uh, thing with this too is, when we have a common specification, uh, we have a shared learning that can be transferred from one platform to another. If I have developers that are coming into the organization that have ex experience with platform A, they don't have to relearn that. There's a, there's a set of experiences and knowledge that they have that where they can get up and running without having to learn a proprietary DSL. So the first thing is that you said it right, and this is not a new problem. We have seen so many times before, you know, uh, different people, they try to reinvent the wheel again and again and again. And that's where open source come to help. You have solved a problem, you share the solution with others, and they, they not only use it, they improve it, they improvise on it, and then you learn from them. Uh, uh, I think if I'm not wrong, uh, during the conference, SLO Conf, you also open source SLO, uh, open SLO. So I want to talk about also the open angle, as I was saying earlier, that you talked about the specification side of it. Let's talk about the open sourcing side of it. And also, uh, as you said, the community came together. Well, did this project evolve from Noble Nine and then community embraced it? or the SRE community created something and Noble Land simply led it. So, so talk about the origin and then talk about why you decided to open source it. Yeah, so originally it was at Noble Nine. Uh, there's a number of us that have been, you know, we were batting around these ideas of, you know, this is a problem set that we're solving. Um, and then working with some of the other pro uh, companies that we, you know, we're kind of friends with and partners with and peers with, um, they're solving it in a slightly different way. Um, Alex Hidalgo um, uh, was one of the more what was one of the brainchild children of this, and he you know he talks with a lot of a lot of his friends over at uh, you know like Lightstep and uh, Circle, and, and you know we're, we're all kind of solving this problem together. And so he he reached out to a number of different people um, who showed interest in coming up with a common specification. Um, and so that's kind of where the origin of that was. Um, you know, we, we wanted to, you know, take our learnings, take the things that we're uh, trying to implement. And like you said, uh, have a uh, better the specification, you know, learn from other people's experiences and have, you know, have the tide rise all, raise all boats. Exactly. Uh 
Of course, this is an open source project. Can you also talk about how do you plan to govern the project? These days, sometimes we see a lot of projects go to a neutral foundation so that there is more confidence within the community so they can very easily you know, get involved without fearing that, hey, one vendor controls it, or you're trying to keep it as a noble line open source project. Regardless, there are a lot of, you know, it doesn't, there's nothing wrong, you know, with a vendor owned project versus a foundation owned project because the reason you did open source in the first place was to get community involved. But I'm more interested in, in the governance of the project. How do you plan to get community involved? So uh, we're in the pretty early stages right now, and I think we're still deciding on what that governance structure will be. I think as much as possible, you know, we want Noble Nine to not, we don't want this to necessarily be a Noble Nine uh, project. You know, we want this to be a community project. And so we do want everyone uh, to feel welcome and able to contribute. Um, so that being said, you know, this is something we're still working on. We're still deciding what that's going to be like, what the shape of that governance will be. Um, and being very early right now, um, we're just taking all ideas. Right now we have a Slack channel that uh, people are uh, contributing ideas to furiously. It's amazing. Uh, the amount of uh, excitement that we've seen just in the last day is really amazing. People from all across the uh, industry um, are involved. Um, and so it's kind of evolving naturally right now. And I think that there will be a certain point when we want to talk about, okay, how do we want to govern this? But I think there's a, uh, you know, that'll be after we kind of get around this initial phase. But no, no I, don't, I don't think anything's off the table right now. We haven't excluded any possibilities. And that's exactly how open source, right? right? You know, things change as you, uh, you see the, the either interest or adoption or whatever the community wants. Now, uh, can you also talk about the scope of this project, uh, because observability is playing a very critical role in today's, you know, uh, cloud native. You know, you cannot if you don't have any visibility into what you're doing. And then also, this is getting. Uh, we talk about security. I mean, there are a lot of components. So talk about uh, whether this SLO, uh, open SLO, remain to solve a specific problem, or you see that hey, you know what, it might go beyond that. I think right now we want this to be inside the scope of just SLOs. So uh, agnostic of the data source, agnostic of the platform, we want it to just be able to express SLOs in a kind of a portable, standardized way. Um, that could be any number of, uh, you know, that could be applied to any number of contexts too. Like you bring up like security, you know what I mean? We have something you want to in integrate it with your seam. We, you know, at, at some point you might be able to do that. Uh, you know, as long as you can query a data source, the idea is that you can build an SLO out of that and be able to express that in some meaningful way. As you were saying earlier that um, initially when people were trying to um, solve this problem, on, you know, they were doing a lot of work internally. And sometimes what happened is that when you are left to solve your problem on your own, it sometimes delays embracement of certain technologies. But when you come up with, you know, open SLO specification and also as an open source project, do you see, think that it will accelerate the adoption of SLO practices as well? Yeah, that is actually one of the primary motivating factors in open sourcing this is that we want to ease the adoption. You know, we want to help solve as many problems as we can uh, and clear those hurdles for people to adopt SLOs. Um, I think the community that's around that surrounds us really sees the power of what SLOs can be and how they can help organizations. And we're really hoping um, that by that through this we can help ease that adoption. Uh, I, you know, uh, through both like the specification and then the command line tool Oslo. You know, we want to be able to organizations to be able to just kind of add this onto their existing infrastructure. Again, this is not gonna be something where they have to re-implement. This is not re, uh, uh, replacing any tools. This is gonna be an additive thing. But again, we wanna make sure that we uh, reduce as many hurdles as possible, answer as many questions as we can, put tooling in place so that you know, we can have like linting, uh, validation of those files, things like that, that, that can be then integrated into your CI and CD pipeline to help you know, put those guardrails in place. If you know, you know, uh, you know, make sure that those YAML files and that you have your configuration, your definitions in that are the correct and valid. Um, 
so and, and all in the pursuit of making this easier, making it easier for organizations to adopt these and implement them so they don't see them as this huge barrier. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to you don't have to fully understand what uh, uh, SLOs would are to be able to adopt and do a hello world and a kind of a POC for your organization to kind of help getting by help get buy in. Excellent. Now, um, the last question before we wrap this up is that you did talk about this, uh, you know, when you're answering that question. But um, do you have any tips or suggestions that how should companies approach SLOs when they're trying to implement them internally because it's as much of a cultural thing as it's a technology thing. So what are the first steps? What are the what are the hardest parts that you have already seen which company uh, stumble upon? So talk about that. Yeah, um, Alex actually in his book uh, really outlines it really well. You know, there's, I think, if you approach it as a, the reliability stack, on the bottom you're gonna have your SLIs. And those are going to be your, your kind of core kind of KPIs. Like what, what you know, what is this, what does this service need? Um, you know, what are, you know, whether that's going to be kind of the kind of the golden signals based uh, indicators like, you know, latency, saturation, things like that. Whatever is, whatever your application needs to be successful or you want to put into an SLI and that's going to be like your binary kind of like yes, no, true, false type query. Um, one level above that are going to be your SLOs, and, and those are going to be your objectives that you're going to try and hit. Like, so to that SLI of you know uh, uh, successful requests in your SLO, you'll say, "I want like 95 of these to be successful." Uh, and so you want to d then define what your SLOs are, with the idea that these are user based. SLOs. So what that user can either be external or internal. So that user could be another, either another service or an actual human being on the other end of it. So like, you know, what was the render time? We want this render, to, we have an SLO on a, on a render time to be less than like, you know, one second. Um, because the idea is you want to have your users, um, your user experiences to be happy. You want, you know, and that's also dependent on your service. What different services have different uh, metrics for what is a successful user journey or a user experience. Those then, those SLOs then feed up under the top of the pyramid with error budgets. So as you miss your SLOs, you're going to eat into your error budget, and that's your, and also your error budget. Just take a step back. You know that that's going to be your kind of reliability. Um, and so you know if you have time in your error budget left, if you haven't eaten into uh, that too much from violating your SLOs. Um, you, you have things you can do then. You can do chaos testing, you can do load testing, saturation testing, things like that, that would cause you know momentary di downtime because you are still within your error budget. Um, other side of that, if you've gone past, if you've eaten into your um, uh, error budgets, if your burn rate has exceeded that, um, you know that that then needs to or you need to have your shift into reliability rather than feature development. Um, so, uh, you know, for organizations that are trying to adopt these, you know, good first steps are, you know, think about the pyramid, start with your SLIs, then your SLOs, and then define your error budgets. Uh, start small. You don't have to do this all at once. It can be a single service um, or a single domain. Um, and review often. If you're not hitting your SLOs like consistently, maybe you need to take a look at like what that SLO is and whether it can be lowered or raised or some you know somewhere in between. You know, having having an SLO that you're always under like significantly, maybe you know that needs to be changed. But review often um, and take a look at what those are. Ian, thank you so much for uh, sitting down with me today and and talk about. Open SLO. I wish we could have done this in person, but I hope the next conference will be in person and we'll sit down together across the table without any mask and talk about all these topics. So thank you and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Swapnil.